My name is uh, Professor Robert Boy. I'm delighted to be chairing this session. My introduction will be short. I've known um, Associate Professor Phil Britton for over 15 years, and he's a, a fantastic speaker, and he knows his stuff back to front. He's talking tonight about RSV in Australia. Before I ask him to speak, I will acknowledge the elders of this land, past, present, and emerging. Uh, we are fortunate to live on Aboriginal land, and I acknowledge that. Uh, so um, <clears throat> without further ado, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Phil Britton uh, to talk about RSV in Australia. What's relevant to you? Over to you, Phil. Brilliant. Thanks, Robert, for the introduction. And um, look, I'm going to start just with a short YouTube video, only for a minute and a half, but it, it captures so much of the, the clinical um, sense, certainly from a paediatric perspective of RSV, that, that I think it's useful to just start with something short um, to, to give you a flavour of where we're heading. Clinging tightly to his mommy and his favorite stuffed animal, little Adam is your typical 10-month-old. But he had a rough start. At just six weeks old, Adam's mom, Shanesty, shot this video because it looked like Adam was having trouble breathing. You could see his rib cage. He had a little bit of a V right here. He was really labored in his breathing, and he was vomiting after every feeding. Adam was diagnosed with RSV, a respiratory virus that can make it difficult for young babies to breathe. RSV alone is the single most common cause of hospitalization among children less than one year of age in the U.S. Last year, we had 600 babies being hospitalized at Nationwide Children's alone with RSV, and probably more than a thousand came to the emergency room. Dr. Octavio Romillo says most babies with RSV recover without the need for hospitalization, but some develop severe symptoms that can become life-threatening. The first subtle thing is that they cannot take the bottle very well. The second is the breathing is not very balanced. Parents and caregivers can reduce the risk of RSV by washing their hands, disinfecting hard surfaces, and avoiding sharing dishes and utensils. Very young babies should not be exposed to a lot of people. Their immune system, the white cells that protect us against infections are not ready yet. Lots of babies don't survive. We were one of the lucky ones. Yeah. At Nationwide Children's Hospital, I'm Nikki Ch So great, gonna stop sharing there and, and bring up some slides that I'll, I'll talk through. So yeah, we're here to talk about RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. And uh, this is really an enormous topic. And I, I'm i really gonna cover, try to cover a lot of ground, try to touch on most things that I think are of importance in this space, but acknowledging right from the start that I'm not gonna cover everything. Also acknowledging from the start that I'm a paediatrician and clinician predominantly. I do have, you know, postgraduate qualifications in public health and epidemiology, but really I'm a clinician. And there will be people attending tonight who may well have, you know, much deeper expertise than me in all sorts of areas of importance. So um, very happy for questions, very happy for challenges, very happy for corrections if people feel that that's necessary along the way. Um, I will disclose that um, I did a talk um, that was uh, funded in a symposium by Sanofi earlier this year, received an honorarium paid to my institution, not to me personally, but they are the developer of one of the leading new preventative tools. So you just need to take that into account. Um, and this is what I'm going to cover. We've given the teaser there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about virology, epidemiology, and burden of disease, prevention of RSV, and treatment. And uh, hopefully there's something in this for everybody. So I will also just point to a very recently published and compre comprehensive review of emerging prevention of RSV in the Lancet Infectious Diseases with a very eminent authorship. Um, and it's available online and very much worth um, people uh, 
engaging in, particularly those interested in prevention. Um, so why don't we start by talking about the virus? This is it. It's an RNA virus in the paramyxovirus uh, viridae family. It's um, characterized by these or, or, or understood at a, at a public health and prevention and vaccinology level, predominantly in terms of the two surface proteins, the fusion protein, the F protein there in light blue, and the attachment glycoprotein in G, G there in, in sort of a purple colour, or mauve cover, colour. And those two pro proteins are really worth highlighting because the F protein is a critical protein in terms of um, the viral attachment and propagation in the human body. And it's also a key focus of um, the immune response in terms of preventing infection. And so all the stuff that we'll be talking about in terms of prevention and preventative tools, vaccines and, and monoclonal antibodies uh, are focused on the F protein. In terms of the attachment glycoprotein, it's the attachment glycoprotein that's used um, to describe particularly the variability in the virus um, in, in sequencing, um, but also um, uh, in terms of its two main subtypes, the RSVA and RSVB antigenically varied viruses of RSV. So worth just understanding that, of course, the virus doesn't look like a per per perfect sphere like this when you look at it under a microscope. Now, when we talk about syncytia, the syncytia here are when this virus infects a cell um, the fusion protein then get, gets expressed on that cell and becomes the means by which cells are then joined and essentially these bindings between proximate cells or syncytia are formed. And here in this pathological slide, uh, in the insert there, what you see is effectively a respiratory epithelial cell that has multiple nuclei in it because it's become all of those cells have become fused as these syncytia have formed. And then you also see there in that kind of um, slightly denser pink color, you see viral inclusion proteins as a kind of viral inclusion body in that giant cell. And that process of syncytial formation and then inflammatory response and sloughing of the respiratory um, uh, uh, epithelial cells in the upper and lower respiratory tract in partic particular really are the, the key pathogenic um, process uh, caused by this virus. You essentially clog up your airways, particularly in young babies. So I've got five slides now to try to illustrate to you just how burdensome RSV is, both at a global and local level, and then drill down onto some of the, the issues that arise uh, and some of the variants in different age groups. So this is just a study of burden of disease, particularly in children under five at a global level. You can see there on the left, um, the kind of global distribution. Again, red is bad, um, light, uh, lightest blue is better. And you see that this is a disease that is globally distributed, but that the burden of severe disease or hospitalization occurs in um, low and middle income countries. If you look at all acute lower respiratory tract infection or ALRI, and you study children presenting with ALRI, ALRI, and you study them to see that what, what bacteria and viruses and fungi can you detect in these children. This is what Kate O'Brien's study that was published in 2019 attempted to do. What you see is that RSV comes up as the most frequently detected cause in children, that if you stratify it by age, it's more frequently detected in children under one than children over one. That's panel B there. And if you stratify it by severity, you see that it's more often detected or it's a higher proportion of kids. It's detected if they have more severe disease. That's panel C. So 
we can conclude from this that RSV is a burdensome infection, particularly in children under five at a global level, worse in low and middle income countries than high income countries, that it is the number one infectious cause of death and death is in the lower panel on the left versus hospitalization in the upper panel on the left. It's the number one infectious cause of death in children under five at a global level is ALRI and RSV is the number one cause of that disease okay so big deal if we look at it in terms of hospitalization across the lifespan what these figures show and i'll take the, you through them is that the burden of hospitalization top left is most frequent in younger children so what this shows is the counts of hospitalization across a 10-year period in australia and you can see this very steep rise in hospitalizations as you go down in months. This is not in years. This is months in children under five. Okay. If you go to the top right, moving down the page, this shows you the rates of hospital admission by age group across the 10 year period that was studied. And you can see that in under two month olds, you see rates of hospitalization in the 2000s per 100,000 or two per 100. Okay. And as you get older, three to five months, six to 11 months, 20, 12 to 23 months, those rates of hospitalization get lower. And you have to go to a different y axis once you go to two to five year olds there in panel B, but you still see a high rate of hospitalization 30 to 60 per 100,000 and if you go to the bottom in adults what you see is a completely different y axis we're now looking at 0 to 20 per 100,000 and it's fairly stable across all age groups but there is a clear rise in over 65 year olds and it's very peculiar here you see this very low rate in the early period of this study and then a very high rate in the late period and effectively that is the period in which we start testing much more comprehensively for rsv amongst hospitalized adults so there is a high rate of hospitalization it's highest in very young children but then you see at the other end of the lifespan particularly above in adults aged over 65. Now, it's also a seasonal virus. You can see in the bottom left panel here, a study we did at the Children's Hospital looking at RSV A and RSV B over a five-year period. And you can see this very metronomic seasonality with some variance in A versus B year on year, but a balanced distribution across the whole period of time. And amongst hospitalized children, we saw over a five-year period, an ICU admission rate of 14.5%. A lot of the, all of this work here on this slide done by Gemma Saravanos, a, 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 a nurse researcher who did her doctorate on respiratory viral disease, particularly RSV. So that's global distribution and burden. That's hospitalization burden. Now let's talk about mortality. And again, particularly focused on children here, if we look at the left-hand side here, this is a study looking at mortality in children under five. And from panel A, B, and C down the left, we see the distribution of, um, of mortality in low and lower middle income countries at the top, middle income countries in the bottom, in the middle, and high income countries at the bottom. And effectively, what this shows is that in low and middle income countries, the, the burden of mortality is mainly in very young children, and that there's a balanced burden of mortality in both children with and without comorbidity with and without prematurity as you go to high income countries you see a lower number of of children who die and you see that the age distribution is older and a much higher proportion in this case 70 percent in this study of all deaths occurring in in children who are preterm or have medical comorbidity which is a, a, a almost a flip to what you see in low income countries. On the right there, this is a more granular study that we did at our hospital over a 25 year period looking at deaths from RSV. And you can see that, you know, in panel A there, the deaths per year are in the order of one or two deaths. So it's infrequent. 
And when you calculate that as a mortality rate at a population level, and there's assumptions that go into that, you end up with about one per million population children less than 16. So this is a rare, death in a high income country is rare from RSV. Now, interestingly, if you look at death, what we found that was novel in this start study is that all of the deaths that we could uh, detect that were attributable to RSV occurred in children with medical comorbidity, that many of these children were actually older than two years of age, that there was a significant burden of mortality, half of the deaths in children with malignancy and immunosuppression, and um, that that meant that if you're if you're thinking about death, knowing what your situation is across the income spectrum and socio-demographic spectrum is very important. And one final thing that we showed in our study is that half of all the deaths in children in a high income country where medical comorbidity dominates were actually healthcare associated. Okay. Now that has all been children. But over the last 15 years, what we've seen is a very significant increase in our understanding of the burden of disease in adults. Now, I pointed to that uh, in an earlier slide, but this really was a, a landmark study in 2005 from the US published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they established a four-year prospective cohort of adults, both those these were all older adults, older than 65, some with um, cardiorespiratory comorbidity, some without. And they also looked at people admitted with medical, with low, acute lower respiratory tract infection. And what they found is that if you just look at older adults, that RSV infection in the community was more frequent than influenza infection. Now, RSV resulted in less medically attended illness than influenza, but not in the medically comorbid group. So if you have, if you're over 65 and have medical comorbidity, RSV results in you needing to see a doctor as frequently as influenza. And when you look at the admitted cohorts, the ICU admission proportion and the case fatality proportion amongst admitted patients was the same for RSV and influenza. Okay. And at the bottom there, if you then look at coding data and say, let's look at all pneumonia, all chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, all asthma and all cardiac uh, congestive heart failure that required admission to hospital, RSV was associated with somewhere between 5 and 10% of those admissions, which is extraordinary burden of disease. Now, it is very important that influenza vaccine uptake in this population was quite high and that there was significant variability. So the influenza associated with H1N1 tended to be less burdensome, whereas um, influenza associated with H3N2 tended to be significantly more burdensome than RSV, okay? So there is variability, but this really points to the fact that RSV is a rival, if not overtaking, but certainly a rival in terms of severity in older adults as influenza. In the right here is a very significant study of the burden of RSV and influenza and non-RSV influenza viruses in adults in um, long-term uh, long care facilities. And again, what it shows is that effectively RSV is second only to flu and really is getting up towards flu in terms of antibiotic prescriptions, deaths, need for transfer to hospital amongst adults in long-term care facilities. So what we see here is that RSV is very burdensome in older adults. It's right up there with flu, notwithstanding the fact that this is a population that already had flu prevention optimized in many adults. And it's particularly burdensome in long-term care facilities where we congregate adults. And the attack rates for RSV in outbreaks in long-term care facilities, 10 to 20%. Flu tends to be a little bit higher in the published studies, but still that's very high attack rates when you have an outbreak in a long-term care facility. Now, the final burden of disease slide here is to say that not all of the burden of disease of RSV, particularly in children, is short-term. In fact, it's long-term. And these three figures show um, in the left and the top right, a really important study from Scotland looking at children admitted for RSV 
and children not admitted for RSV in un, under the age of two, and then linking their in, the, linking that with long term hospitalisation and long term prescriptions for anti asthma medications, and you can see here on the left just the three to four fold burden in hospitalisation for asthma in children known to have been uh, infected with RSV under two compared to children not known to be infected with RSV under two. And you can also see similarly the significantly increased rate, particularly in young children of anti-asthma medications. Now, this is not this is not causative data. This is associative data, of course, but very compelling data that RSV is associated with prolonged recurrent wheezing. Now, in the bottom right, this is a causative study because this was a randomized controlled trial of palavizumab, a preventative medication for RSV, and then looking over a 12-month period at wheezing as an outcome. And what they showed here is that any wheezing in children with who'd received this anti-RSV medication was reduced by 16%, absolute risk reduction, any wheezing over a 12-month period, and recurrent wheezing down the bottom reduced by 10%. In other words, this study proves in a randomized study that if you prevent RSV infection, that is associated and linked to reduction in wheezing in infants. So there is a long-term burden to RSV in children that is extraordinarily important. So I'm making the case here that when we think about respiratory viruses, we, we're all familiar with influenza. We're now all familiar with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, but the other one in the trio, the big three is RSV and it's big across the lifespan, not just in young children, though it is most burdensome in young children. And so if you just do a sort of back of the envelope direct comparison of these viruses you can see and this is focused on children here this slide you can see that there are some differences in the sense that RSV is mainly in very young children influenza more in the, across the preschool age range SARS-CoV-2 um, increases as children get older particularly into adulthood and young, ad, uh, young adulthood in terms of severity but also has a burden in very young children they're clinically quite different and RSV, as per the teaser at the start, is very much focused on this clinical illness of bronchiolitis in young children. That if you look at the overall severity, the burden of hospitalization is highest with RSV in children. All three can result in ICU admission at a reasonable proportion amongst admitted children. But if you look at deaths, we don't really know over the long term about SARS-CoV-2 deaths, but we know there have been deaths in children in 2022 in, in Australia and a few prior to that. We know that there's about five influenza deaths per annum in Australia and fewer than that in RSV. We know that we have vaccines for, for SARS-CoV-2 that are very effective against severe disease, particularly in um, older children, but increasingly we think in younger children. And we've got vaccines for flu, but there's a gap that needs to be met in RSV. Now, what about costs? There's huge costs associated with, with RSV at a global level. This is a systematic review um, uh, published in Journal of Infectious Diseases in 2020. And it, again, this is high, these are supplementary materials, but they give the highlight numbers. If you look at the total cost of RSV per annum at a global level, we're talking in the order of four to five billion euros in terms of inpatient and outpatient costs, and that's direct costs. And if you look down in the bottom, there's not huge numbers of studies looking at indirect costs, but if you look at non-medical direct costs and indirect costs, there's another additional probably 15 to 20% on top. So another billion dollars in indirect costs, and that's only based upon the, the measured studies and those indirect costs have not been fully uh, aggregated. So this is a huge cost, and that does not talk about the human toll or mortality. This is just the economic cost. So let's move on to prevention because this is a huge emerging space of great importance to, to global health and to Australia. So just a little bit on concepts here. Uh, it's worth separate, separating out in our minds the idea of active immunisation or vaccination, as I call it, versus passive immunisation or immunoprophylaxis. 
And within immunoprophylaxis, we really have two processes, a natural process, and that's the process where mums give babies antibodies across the placenta towards the end of their pregnancy versus therapeutic immunoprophylaxis. And that's where we might give a child an antibody that's specific for RSV and separate that out from a further class, which might be chemoprophylaxis, where we're giving a, a, a chemical or a medication to prevent infection and, uh, and differentiate all of those three from um, non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs, which has become a kind of increasingly used shorthand for public health interventions that are not pharmaceutical. Now, on the right here is a figure from this paper um, published uh, talking about vaccination. And it's useful, and this is focused on children again, I acknowledge, to think about what we might be trying to prevent with these tools, depending on what they are and how they might be used. And you can see in this figure, um, in the dark grey curve at the bottom, essentially hospitalizations of RSV. And you can see in the lighter gray curve that goes up and across and down medically attended RSV or RSV outpatient visits. And you can see that if that's the pattern of disease, that giving mums a vaccine that induces antibodies that are then passed, then, that are then given to the baby in natural immunoprophylaxis will provide antibodies to a baby across the first few months of life. Equally, if we were to give a baby very early on in life a immunoprophylactic tool, a monoclonal antibody, therapeutically early on, we might be able to prolong that antibody coverage across the first six months, seven months, eight months of life. But that if we want to cover RSV as a medically attended problem in young children at, at an older age group, that we would need to have some way of actively uh, immunizing them and and by that we would propose a vaccine but equally the problem with vaccines is that if we if we try to give them early in life they might suffer from interference from maternal antibody or other tools and equally we know that young infants don't mount very effective or protective antibody responses um, early particularly in those first few months of life to vaccines other vaccines that we use and so you can see how the different Different tools will be applied differently depending on what target you're trying to achieve and what disease you're trying to cover. So just to talk about non-pharmaceutical interventions and their effectiveness a little bit, the, the COVID-19 pandemics really opened this up to us with respect to RSV in a way that we've never seen before. And this figure here, again, a paper that Gemma Saravanos was the first author on published in Pediatrics this year, and it's one of many studies looking at RSV and COVID. What this shows here in this epidemiological curve is the detections of RSV in the orange bars, the COVID notifications in the blue, and effectively, early in the pandemic, we do lockdown in early 2020, and we obliterate the expected RSV epidemic that normally would happen in winter. So this, there's no new vaccines here. There's no new fancy therapeutics, just non-pharmaceutical public health interventions completely obliterate RSV. And what we observed, and we've published this as well, is that RSV detections at our hospital were reduced by 95%, bronchiolitis, bronchiolitis admissions by 85%, and all lower respiratory tract infection ED presentations by 70%. Okay, so extraordinarily effective. Now, nobody's suggesting we, we want to do lockdown like that every winter, but it just speaks to how important. Now, what we also saw is that this profound resurgence in the spring of summer of 2020 of RSV at our hospital. And this was also observed nationally. And this pattern's been observed all over the world and published on all over the world now. And just out of interest, we John Sebastian Eden and many colleagues from around the country um, um, did some uh, excellent sequencing of viruses. And what we showed is that that out of season resurgence at the end of 2020 was associated with a collapse in the diversity of RSV. So we talked about that G protein, we talked about genetic diversity, 
And what we saw is this complete collapse. You can see here in this is a global diversity and all the pink identifications are Australian identifications over, uh, over a number of years leading up to 2020. You can see this diversity around the circle. But then in towards the end of 2020, you see this very strong concentration of viruses that are restricted in their genetic um, sequencing. In And it was interesting that this happened separately, one in WA uh, and separately on the East Coast, but again, a restricted diversity of viruses. And what this speaks to is just how important genetic diversity of this virus might be, though we, we have a long, long way uh, to go before we fully understand how that works. And one of the conclusions of this paper is, um, it, it is a suggestion that there might have been something about these viruses in terms of fitness for them being maintained in the population across lockdown um, that led to their leading the resurgence in late 2020. Now, I don't have a lot of time to focus on population transmission, but again, there's a huge amount that needs to be learned in this space. There's uh, lots of modelling studies now over uh, um, the last 10 years showing that uh, in, in models, it, you can approximate the normal seasonal transmission um, and, and that those models are sensitive to a variety of factors, birth rate, climate, the transmissibility of the virus, the duration of immunity and how you model that, the household structure and density of population. All of those factors contribute to population transmission. And what we know is that if you look at households um, in empiric studies, it tends to be older children that drive the introduction of the virus into the household and that transmit the virus to in adults and younger infants. So this is a huge literature, but suffice it to say that that's, that's all I wanted to say about transmission. But we've learned a lot in terms of how disrupted the seasons have been with COVID-19, and that will be a, a, a rich uh, rich area of study moving forward in terms of thinking through uh, how to understand RSV to population level. So I'm going to move on to prevention now for about 10 minutes and then leave hopefully plenty of time for questions. So in terms of our current preventative tools, things that are available um, to us or, or very close to being available to us, the real um, elephant in the room, the big tool is this um, uh, monoclonal antibody palavizumab, an anti-F humanized monoclonal antibody. It's, it's been available for a long time. It's delivered in a five dose course monthly across the RSV season. And it definitely reduces RSV admission in children, particularly children with risk factors, premature children, children with chronic respiratory disease or cardiac disease. The absolute re risk reduction um, um, of admission for RSV is about five or six percent. So that's, you know, to try to introduce a standardized metric across the following slides, you need to treat something like 50, 20 to ch children with risk factors to reduce a single admission. Now, because this um, was targeted to a restricted number of children, and because the company have priced at a very high price, it's not PBS listed in Australia because it's never been shown to be cost effective at a population level. Um, but there's been a huge amount of research modeling the cost effectiveness, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, that's what the ICER, and it's best for preterm children with chronic lung disease. And the guidance around its use at a global level is heterogeneous to say the least. And so it's used uh, heterogeneously and, and used almost exclusively in high income countries, which of course is not where the burden of disease is. Now, a huge advance in the science of RSV prevention uh, occurred in 2013 when um, uh, some scientists did some excellent work to show that there's a very different structure of the F protein between um, its pre-fusion state and its post-fusion state and the key antigens associated with highly neutralizing antibodies um, are, are accessible in the pre-fusion state and they are least accessible in the post-fusion state. Now, I can't go into that anymore, but just to make that point, because uh, in terms of new and emerging tools, 
it 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 explains something about how things have changed uh, in recent years. So I'm going to talk about three phase three completed studies, two for tools that are not going to be progressed, and one for a tool at the bottom that um, is being progressed through licensure as we speak. So the first is this study, which was a vaccine to be given to pregnant women to protect uh, infants against RSV disease. And this is a big randomized study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020. Um, vaccine given to pregnant women trying to prevent medically significant low respiratory tract infection in infants in the first three months of life, so up to 90 days. And this, is, this was a uh, F protein nanoparticle structured around a post-fusion F protein. And unfortunately, this resulted in a negative finding overall um, it, compared to the pre-specified outcome measure. Um, so even though there was an estimated vaccine effectiveness of in the order of 40% in terms of reducing medically attended lower respiratory tract infection and hospitalization, it did not meet the pre-specified requirements. And so this vaccine is not being progressed by the company. And there's there's been a huge literature trying to understand why it wasn't successful, but a couple of factors. One is heterogeneity in the epidemiology of the disease in different sites around the world. And secondly, is um, probably has to do with the post-fusion protein state and its immunogenicity um, for highly uh, neut uh, effective neutralizing antibodies. So the second tool that's gone through phase three studies is this monoclonal antibody, suptavimab. And this was given to preterm infants in one or two doses to prevent RSV confirmed hospitalization or medically attended respiratory infection. And effectively, this was a negative study. It did not reduce um, uh, MARI. You can see in the intervention group, there was 8.1% of medically attended respiratory illness in the placebo group, 7.7%. Now, drilling down on this study, one of the really interesting things was that a lot of the effect, there was a very significant differential between RSVA and RSVB, and that when they went back and sequenced the RSVB in this study, it was a variant that did not have the key antigenic sites against which this monoclonal was targeted. So this speaks to the fact that understanding the antigenic um, target of the monoclonals and whether that antigenic target is present in viruses in your population is incredibly important. And it also speaks to the fact that we need to be aware of variation in the virus when we're using monoclonal antibodies. Now, the third study is this study of a... Um, uh, of a monoclonal called nisevimab um, given to term infants now, um, very important difference, and given in an IMI injection compared to placebo for medically attended RSV or RSV or hospitalization. And this was a positive finding published in the New England Journal this year. You can see that there was an absolute reduction of three to four percent of medically attended RSV or 1% of hospitalized RSV. So a number needed to treat of 26 infants to prevent one medical attendance for RSV infection over a 150 day period and um, a number needed to treat of 100 to present one, prevent one hospitalization. But given the burden of disease, this may well still be hugely valuable as a tool and the company is taking it through um, uh, registration um, in, in a number of countries as we speak. And the pipeline is strong for other preventative tools. This is the PATH snapshot showing all of the different uh, types of vaccines and immunoprophylaxis, where they're up to, uh, phase one, two, three studies. You can see this is drilling down on the PATH database, and this is just the studies in phase three. And you can see there's subunit vaccines from GSK. There's recombinant viral vector vaccines from Janssen. There's a recombinant subunit vaccine from Pfizer. 
And there's also an, an, a, an, another monoclonal from Merck in phase three studies. You can see the monoclonals are being focused on children, whereas the vaccines are predominantly progressing in the adult space at this time. And this is from the, the Lancet ID article I pointed to, which is a very nice figure that just gives you the sense of in time where things are up to. And you can see at the top there, the monoclonals and those vaccines. And the, the thing that's present in this figure that was not pre present in the path snapshot is just how far mRNA um, vaccines are now progressed in terms of RSV. Okay, so that's where we're up to. There's a huge number of emerging tools, some really coming into, into view as we speak, but there are some challenges and we've spoken about some of these, but just to highlight them again, we have the issue of vaccine immunogenicity in young children, but that's the group with the highest burden of disease. We have limitations of maternal vaccination, not just whether the vaccine is efficacious, but just operationalizing it. You know, it's always hard. Women don't get pregnant just when the RSV season is coming along. So how can you optimize delivery? We have that issue with, with pertussis and with flu and with other um, maternal focused vaccines to prevent disease in children. But we also have the issue that maternal vaccination and passive immunoprophylaxis via the maternal route, the natural route to children, is restricted for preterm infants because most of that antibody transfer happens in the third trimester and actively increases across the third trimester. So one of the groups at highest risk, preterm infants, are going to have a, a limited uh, uh, benefit from maternal vaccination. Another thing is that um, we really have not uh, explored what are the key outcomes of vaccination in older infants, give, uh, in older children, given that they don't get severe disease very often, often, but they may well be important transmitters. Another thing is that there is some evidence that you get any drug antibodies to the monoclonals, though they have not shown to be important in terms of palivizumab over a very long time, but it's an important point. And we talked a little bit in that uh, uh, sutivimab study about virus changes or immune escape that can occur. So RSV prevention summary, the key populations are young children and targeting pregnant women, under ones and under fives, older adults and the immunocompromised, that there's a significant burden in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries, and that we have vaccines, that there's been some disappointment, but there's a strong pipeline and, and that we have um, immunoprophylaxis coming online, one very promising tool. Um, but there's a lot of room to move in terms of how these things will work together, um, what's the, the mix in different settings, and of course, what will be the equity of availability of these different tools at a global level. And now I don't want to talk too much about disease management, just to say that most disease management is supportive, particularly in infants, that there is a great debate and controversy around um, supportive care, particularly around high flow nasal prong oxygen that I don't have time to go into, but an important issue in terms of case management in hospital. And just to speak a little bit about antivirals, we've had one antiviral for a long time, ribavirin, but it doesn't really work for the, the most, the biggest burden of disease, which is low respiratory tract in, uh, infection in infants. Um, but it does have a role in immunocompromised patients, but the, there's variable recommendations and all sorts of issues with delivery. There is a quite a large pipeline of antivirals for RSV2, but they're all in the preclinical or phase one, two stage. So there's a, a long way to go, I think, on those. And I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Robert. Bill, thank you so much. That was a tour de force. Um, we've had over 100 people in attendance and we've got a, a few questions. I'll start myself um, <clears throat> with some fairly simple questions. Why is it that there's a peak at one or two months of age when mothers are giving children the antibodies to RSV to which they've been exposed to over years and decades? Yes. So the thinking around that is probably that in natural immunity to the virus, 
there is uh, two issues. One is that um, the actual level, the tighter of antibody that, that women of childbearing age have to give to their babies may be insufficient to prevent disease. And secondly, is actually around um, the specificity and neutralizing capability. So how focused are they on the pre-fusion? Is form. that because the virus has mutated or because the mother just hasn't made enough? Uh, no, I I, I, so, so immunity to this virus in terms of humoral immunity or antibodies, which we're very focused on, um, wanes over time and is only partially effective ever at preventing reinfection. What do you think about the correlate with uh, vaccinating pregnant mothers against pertussis? I mean, it's a different pathogen, but are there interesting correlations to draw? Um, only, I think, in general terms, Robert, in the sense that both and, and, and there's quite a bit of emerging data for flu and even emerging data for COVID, as you know, Robert, that this is a strategy that can work. I, I think that's where the correlation is. I think beyond that, it would be hazardous to say because it works for those infections, it's clearly going to work for this infection. I, I, I think the work needs to be done. Um, but, but the study, the Mardi study, even though it was determined by the company to be to, to be a negative finding because it didn't meet their pre-specified requirements to advance the, it, it still showed significant reduction of disease. And as you drill down in post hoc analyses to children with risk factors and hospitalization and severe disease, the prevention actually, the, the, prevented, the vaccine efficacy goes up. So will this work? I think it will. Do we have the, the vaccine yet that's going to make it work? No, we haven't pro proven it. But maternal vaccination is, I think, at the moment, our best strategy for the very youngest children in whom the burden is highest. And, and a better strategy overall than, than um, monoclonal antibodies, I think. But that'll be debated by the audience, I know. Do you think there's any hope for us to fund vaccines that we use first in other countries? which really need it compared to Australia, where you describe uh, at most a handful of deaths each year from RSV. How do we go forward with introducing a vaccine? Do we do it in a rich country in order to fund the production and distribution in a poor country? Or what do we do? Yeah, so that's a great question. And and I there, there was a slide that I had that has dropped off this presentation just to highlight the the disaster that has been global vaccine efficacy for COVID-19. And I think disaster is the right word to use. And, and there needs to be a lot of soul searching um, still at a global level around how poorly we've done getting vaccines to where it's needed with COVID. And RSV, I mean, you know, um, Fiona Russell um, who, who I spoke to this, about this recently would say that, you know, pneumococcus is the example par excellence where we've got great vaccines and we give them to, to high income countries and we have not achieved the distribution globally that we need to achieve. But I think RSV even more than pneumococcus. Um, the burden is overwhelmingly in low and middle income countries in terms of the worst outcomes. And all vaccine producers and all public health people um, and, and physicians need to have in their discussions that that vaccine equity, equity issue you know moving forward I know I'm I'm an Australian clinician I'm based in Australia my advice is sought by Australian public health authorities and Australian clinicians but in every conversation I'm so glad you brought it up we need to say all of these tools need to be funneled to where the disease is worst and it needs to be just a, a, a commitment we make to one another moving forward. Thanks, Phil. A um, couple of questions coming through. Uh, one from Tommy Liu. Uh, great talk. Would you be able to comment on whether there's increased burden in the Indigenous community? Yeah, Tommy, I'm so glad you've raised that too. And, and I assume you've raised it because you know the answer, which is 
the burden is greater in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and young children in Australia, considerably greater, twofold at least greater. Um, so, it, it, yeah, I mean, we we need to we need to think about that. Um, uh, and and really, if you go back to the transmission issue. Uh, the transmission slide I raised in terms of the multiplicity of factors that um, feed into transmission and severity of disease, most of those factors um, where they're human and behavioural factors are overrepresented in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So again, that speaks to the fact that we need to prioritise them in Australia in terms of how we take up these tools moving forward. Going back 20 years, we did prioritise Indigenous Australians for the introduction of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And in the last couple of years, we prioritised Indigenous people for the introduction of meningococcal B vaccination. So we've and, got. And, and for flu vaccine, flu vaccine was funded, you know, and, and remains funded for a broader distribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples than, than non. So, yeah, important. And I. I, I I think it will be prioritised for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids, but it's an important point to make. Uh, a question from Joanne Tully. I'm not sure if it's the Joanna Tully I know, but uh, uh, are they continuing to develop RSV vaccines for both children and adults? Yes, yes. So in all of that pipeline, there are vaccines being developed um, for, for pregnant women, um, for older adults and for um, children. Now, broadly speaking, the vaccines for older adults and pregnant women are actually the same vaccines, but there's just different studies, depending on how it's being targeted. Really, that the, the, the big difference between the adult and the children is that the live attenuated um, vaccine pipeline is really being targeted for children. And so that's the probably the big difference in terms of the vaccines that are moving forward. But all groups um, um, are being focused on, um, save for the fact that there's not a lot of optimism about vaccine development for the very young infants. So that's where the monoclonals are really being focused and maternal vaccine, yeah. Well, that's very helpful. Do you see the way forward, what with the tremendous developments in mRNA and multi-component vaccines, that we might go forward with a flu and RSV or a flu and RSV and COVID vaccine. How do you see that playing out for children? Yeah. So certainly in the mRNA space, multi-component vaccines are happening. And as I understand it, there is an RSV flu um, develop, you know, combination development program. Now, you all know better than me, Robert, which company that's with, but we don't need to mention the company. But no, we don't. <laughs> I can't recall. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I'm agnostic about multi-component vaccines at this stage, I must admit. I know there's a huge enthusiasm at the moment, for example, around the bivalent um, COVID vaccines, mRNA COVID vaccines, but I'm agnostic about them, I must say. I'm not actually sure that they're going to make a, they're going to be a big game changer, but, you know, again, there'll be people online here who will shout me down about that and point me to certain data, but I'm not convinced they are big game changers at the moment, certainly not with Omicron as the virus being chosen uh, um, uh, uh, to be added. I, I think it's not a great one to choose myself, but... Um, so, so I'm agnostic about bi bivalent vaccines. I know I can see that I can see the appeal. Can we get one jab, cover a whole bunch of things? But I, I, I think we should have a very open mind about that at this time, and not be and not be overcommitted to that as the way forward. Yes, it's hard to predict the future when it hasn't happened already. Joanne Tully has a supplementary question for you, and it really goes back to the theme that you've been on. Um, how do we get how do we get vaccines to the poorest countries? Is it sufficient finances that's the problem? Surely organizations around the world could do better in organizing for this to happen and I'll give you a soapbox to go to that. Yeah, yeah no, well look, Joan, there's actually quite a literature around this now. So that so people really are trying to think this through. And and changing the game is not is not one factor right so it's money is a problem right there is inadequate resourcing 
to to buy the vaccines and deliver them. There are issues around cost. There are issues uh, of vaccines. There's huge issues associated with that around intellectual property. There's issues around manufacturing capability in low and middle income countries. Um, there's issue around delivery. You know um, the mRNA vaccines and the cold chain that's required, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a multiplicity of issues. And I can tell you people are talking about it and there is a very big effort going on to try to address those issues in multiple different ways. You know, notably is the mRNA manufacturing um, uh, capacity work that's happening with facilities being developed in Africa so that they can develop vaccine in Africa, facilities being developed in South America, um, in, in Asia. So look, there's a lot of work going on in this space and, and there has been a big push that's arisen from the soul searching because of the inequity of vaccine um, delivery in COVID. But, but we can't let go of the momentum, you know, um, that, that has, has arisen. And we, we really, it's really incumbent, I think, on people in high income countries and beyond medical in civil society to say it's not okay to have this massive inequity and that, that things like vaccines and their equivalents, monoclonal antibodies, really need to be thought of as global public goods. They're not just commercial products to be bought and sold by the highest bidder. They are global public goods and the market needs to be, the market needs to be um, constrained. Now, you know, there'll be, there'll be pharmaceutical representatives maybe online who are, who are worrying about me saying this, but it's not because we need pharmaceutical to develop these products. We need pharmaceutical industry because they're the people with the expertise around manufacturing, logistics, rah, 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 rah. but we need the, the, those people to see what they do in terms of global public good, not just terms of commercial models. And we need the financing world to come on board to meet that gap for companies and to scaffold funding. And, and, you know, this is well beyond, I'm talking well beyond my expertise here, but they're the kinds of issues in play. Uh, briefly, Phil, I want to thank you. Um, I'll give Joanne Tully a, um, a comment. Getting vaccines to remote Indigenous communities is an issue because of the inability to employ registered nurses to vaccinate in these communities. So sad. And, you know, you've listed another four or five other issues as well. If you were to speculate where we're going in the next one to two years in Australia, um, could you briefly um, give us that as your parting shot? Yes. Um, where are we going in the next one to two years? So that's a relatively short term horizon. Look, I think we will see phase three results of vaccines in adults and pregnant women, and they'll be encouraging. We won't see those things being available in the clinic, I think, in the next 12, 18 months. I think we will see uh, nursivimab progressed through registration, and there'll be very strong um, efforts towards making that available. The big challenge around that will be cost of the product and matching the cost with the commitment to deliver it. Now, remember... To prevent one hospitalisation with nirsevimab, you need to give it to 100 children, right? I, I do not want to ov overstate its efficacy. And I want everyone to know that they did pay my institution an honorarium. I disclosed that at the start. So it is, it, it is an important tool. It's, I think, a much better tool than palavizumab in terms of its ability to be operationalised. If it's priced appropriately and made available, it will help and it will make a difference for, for hospitalisation in children. But because of the number needed to treat the absolute risk reduction, you really need to use it in a different way to how we've ever thought about monoclonal antibodies before. You can't just, having said that, even if we could get it to high risk comorbid children in our setting, it would make a difference, I think. Um, and, and and it would be it would make a bigger difference than palavizumab just because of the practicalities, but um, uh, that's that's really the next one or two years. Watching the phase three results as they come through, because they will be coming through in the next one or two years across multiple different 
um, types of vaccines and in multiple different age groups, but they're not going to be in the clinic, I don't think, in the next one or two years. Phil, thanks so much. Our time's up. Love to get you back in one or two years. <laughs> Stay well, and um, I hope people have um, appreciated everything you've given to this. And please note that uh, it'll be recorded and you'll be able to access it uh, at a later time as well, pretty soon anyway. Thanks, Phil. Cheers. No, thanks, Robert. And thanks to everybody who's joined.